the system approaching perfection. We'll walk deeper into the belly of the beast if it means I'm able to further humbling to the ground. And welcome to the Crypto Show's Digital Cash Evolution right here in Phoenix, Arizona on KFNX. And I'm in studio with Doug, the great guy here, Doug Hodges, who runs Phoenix Crypto, who is going to be your go-to source for everything crypto here in uh, Phoenix, if you want to learn how to get wallets and everything. Uh, Doug? Yeah, we got some new guys in the studio today. I'll let you introduce them in a minute. It's, yes. really, it's really awesome to see more people. Man, I'm always running into more people. Every time I think I've met most of the people in the kind of crypto scene in Phoenix, and uh, they, they just come out of the, They come out of the woodwork, yeah. right? Yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so we, we do have some special guests in studio who are actually from uh, Arizona State University, and one is another member of uh, Dash, and Dash is our sponsor. Uh, go to dash.org and check that out. That is a, a fork of Bitcoin, which cryptocurrency, of course, is what we're talking about. And they are based right here in Phoenix. So they, they got their start here in Phoenix. So it is, a, it is a Phoenix company, but it's also global. It's a global currency. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, so what do we got planned, though, for tonight? Let's, let's let people know what they can do. Tonight, we're talking crypto. So we want all of you. Everyone listening here. <laughs> and it goes for you guys uh, yeah, in the studio, good too. No, uh, we are going to be at <laughs> Classic Crust Pizza at Cave Creek and Cactus Road after the show today, probably starting around 6. And um, if the crypto curious, we want you to come down and get your questions answered and uh, learn from other crypto experts and crypto, you know, attempting to be experts. experts and. Uh, so, yeah, you, you, you come and get some pizza, you set up a wallet, you get some free cryptocurrency, which you can then turn around and buy pizza or beer with at Classic Crust. So that, that's one of the great things about Classic Crust Pizza is it's a great learning experience when you actually get to see cryptocurrency being used for what it's intended. Uh, then you kind of get what it means. Um, go ahead and say, wh what does cryptocurrency actually mean? You know, just yeah. the, the idea of being able to open the wallet instantly and, and be in business. Yes. So, if, first of all, if you're driving and you're listening and you're curious and you have questions, uh, go ahead and call us at 602-277-KFNX. That's 277-5369. We'll take your calls. But, um, you know, Bitcoin, you know, the white paper calls it a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash. And to me, the key word on that is cash and electronic cash. And so digital ca cash, digital cash, yeah. the word cash gets thrown around. It can sometimes be used interchangeably for just money, US dollar. Uh, but, but in the, in the literal sense, cash is physical paper money. When we pay for any goods or services and we hand that to some, to another party and we, you know, mutually agree to purchase a product or whatever. And when we part ways, I have my receipt, but I can't reverse that transaction because I gave you physical paper physical money so bitcoin is the first digital cash ability to simulate that experience in that when you send bitcoin or cryptocurrency from one party to another it is irreversible and the only way you're going to get that money back is the way you would typically do with cash you would bring your receipt and you would mutually agree you know you weren't happy with the product or whatever that is but that that's important for for businesses that accept credit cards it's very expensive to Accept a credit card, much less all the fraud that happens with credit cards. So Bitcoin eliminates all of that. Right. And, you know, Bitcoin, uh, it came about kind of an, as an organic thing, more or less. Uh, there's nobody is really in charge of it. No, nobody gives it its direction other than the people who are coding it. Uh, and uh, these other cryptocurrencies, the, the altcoins and everything, have stepped up and they have new ways of kind of organizing their organization so that they can get things done with their DAOs and, and all these different things. And we have a guy in here today. He is the lead strategist for Dash. And I wanted to ask him like some of the things that, like, how is it that you guys choose to get into a certain country? I mean, what is it? Uh, what do you do as a strategist to, to think about getting into a new country or something? Well, we're looking at some of that right now. <clears throat> and we plan to go over that in our quarterly, which is on the 9th or the 10th. But in general, the way we look at payments is there's money, there's the currency that you're using, and there's the network that you're riding it on, whether that's a cash handling network or credit card network or whatever that is. And so for us, we want to look at um, – well, let me back up. We 
at Dash are sort of like a values organization. Our goal is to improve financial freedom, and we want to do that by giving people a better way to pay and get paid. The people with the worst options are going to be the people that have the worst currency. For them, all payment methods are going to be bad, whether they're using credit card, wires, cash, or whatever it is. Um, and so for us, we want to look at a little bit of combination of greatest needs, who, who needs the Dash technology the most, and then a little bit of greatest fit, where do we think we're most competitive? And so right now we're looking at currencies that have uh, countries that have currency problems and then also looking at the other payment network methods and picking which ones do we think we're most competitive against and then which regions do we want to go after and what industries within those regions. And we're going to announce that in about two weeks from now. Right. You know, and, and something else uh, that's kind of popped up is, is Venezuela, you know. Venezuela became uh, kind of a use case and it, it – it started out of a proposal for Dash, somebody that was in Venezuela, seen how the funding uh, was issued and that they could actually put a proposal in and push Dash forward by uh, having these uh, conferences every month. And then that evolved into kind of a, a, an outreach for businesses. And currently there's over 400, almost 500 businesses in Venezuela that are actually accepting this currency as payment. In fact, it, exceeds Bitcoin and all the others in Venezuela per currently as far as acceptance because uh, the people were actually able to be incentivized to get out there and push it forward. But, but more important, I think, is that even as unstable as cryptocurrencies are, it's far more stable than the boulevard. Uh, what do you see for other countries uh, like, say, Argentina uh, in, in that aspect? Uh, well, I mean, I think any, any country that has a currency problem is going to yeah. be interested in accepting the risks associated with crypto. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing that not just in Latin America, you're seeing that in other places. I don't know too much about the specifics with Argentina per se. Uh, right. So I can't, I can't necessarily comment yeah, on that. There you go. Side. Okay. Um, so Doug, give us a. Give us a wrap up on uh, what to expect tonight because we'll, we'll be coming to break here in a minute. What can we expect as far as getting, uh, you know, learning things about setting up wallets and. I, you know, my, I say just do it. You know, Nike model. The best way to learn cryptocurrency is to download a wallet. We'll send you a few bucks in Bitcoin or Dash or something else. And that will go so much further in, in your ability to start to comprehend how this whole thing, what it, what, how it looks, how it works, how it feels, yeah. than me sitting explaining how this thing and what it is for an hour. Right. You know, I, I mentioned earlier the aha moment. Mm. When, explain that, like when you actually realized that this app did not ask you for virtually anything and you were just able to open the app and, and directly yeah. do commerce just right, just that fast. I mean, People within come in, one minute, you were actually transacting. People come in and they're unsure of how long it's going to take, how is the whole process going to go. They feel awkward, clumsy. And when I get the, the wallet downloaded, it doesn't ask for their identity or anything else. And within a few minutes, I've sent them value or cryptocurrency, and boom, the light bulb goes off. It's amazing. All right. We'll see you out there tonight. All right. And take back the power to your own bank. That's how you can take back the power. Take back the power from the bankers and be your own bank and open your own wallet. And uh, as I always say, go to Edge Wallet on, on in the Play Store, the iOS Store, and just download that wallet. It's a really easy wallet to, to download and use, and it has multiple currencies on it, and it's pretty reliable. There are other uh, multiple currency wallets, but I don't think they, they're quite as reliable as Edge. In, in that manner. Uh, but like we were talking about earlier, we're going to have a, a deal come out tonight at Classic Crust Pizza at 6 p.m. or later. We'll be there till probably 10 or so. And we'll set you up with a wallet and, and get you some cryptocurrency, show you how to buy a beer and whatever. Uh, we've, got, we've got a few guys here from ASU. And since we're talking about learning about uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchains and all this, Let's get into some uh, basic terminologies, and uh, let's start it off with you, Doug. What what are one of the number yeah. one things that, that people ask you about? Let's look at the term peer-to-peer, -peer, which I brought up already. And so peer-to-peer -peer means that is directly between you and the other person in the way that um, when I use the example of paying with cash, pay a ten, you pay your bill with a $10 bill. There are two parties involved in that transaction, you and the merchant. 
as opposed to if you're using a MasterCard, Visa, whatever. There's multiple parties involved. There's middlemen. Um, each piece get, gets a piece of the pie. Each adds complexity, which adds cost. So peer-to-peer -peer, um, is a much more efficient system. You know, another term that we hear a lot in, in Bitcoin and crypto is decentralized. And so decentralized means that there's no central party. There's, there is no middle party. It kind of goes hand in hand with peer to peer. And that's, so that's between um, you and the other party. And so, um, you know, some other terms that we can touch on here, you know, um, let's inter get these guys introduced. Yeah. Uh, so and, and Jer we have Jeremy Liu who is working at ASU, uh, sponsored by Dash, and uh, he's trying to get people interested in blockchain and uh, digital currencies as well. And Avery, excuse me, what's your last name? Carter. Avery Carter. So these guys are working on a project that Dash actually funds here at Arizona State University. Uh, but before we get into any of that, Jeremy, what's, what's your term? Uh, what, what's the term that people always ask you about on cryptocurrency? Like, I think my term is exchanges, and I think why I'm, I like this term is because I think there's a misconception where a lot of people get into Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies or digital currencies in general at first, maybe through an investment standpoint. And they see these exchanges and they see that they do hold the cryptocurrency there and they kind of confuse it for a wallet. And I want to clear this misconception up to where when I talk about a wallet or a wallet that I recommend to people, it's a wallet that you own the private keys that you own everything. And therefore, like you said earlier, you know, be your own bank. If you own the private keys and to your own wallet and nobody else has access to it, you truly own your own money. Now, a lot of people use these exchanges, which are platforms for you to trade between cryptocurrencies or to, into fiat. And they do offer a wallet service where you can store cryptocurrencies on their exchange, but that shouldn't be confused with the wallet that you should hold most of your cryptocurrency in or where, that you should use on a regular basis because you do not own those keys and there are, you know, exchanges do hold a the lot phrase, of digital currencies. Uh, what's the phrase? Not your keys, not your money. Exactly. Yeah. And, um, and I, I just want to make that uh, misconception clear where exchanges do have their purpose, um, but the purpose is not to be your permanent wallet that you use. Um, it, your wallet it's is the same as, a, the same as a bank, only with cryptocurrencies, you don't have a uh, you know, big daddy insurance company coming around bailing you out. Exactly. Or, exactly. Uh, you know, you have to be a little bit more. This is responsible money. As well. Yeah. <laughs> so. so we talk about these terms, uh, public keys and private keys. Uh, Avery, what's your take on kind of a simple uh, definition of public keys versus private keys? Okay. So, yeah, that is kind of going off of what Jeremy just talked about with exchanges and owning your own keys and stuff like that. So bottom line, if you control your private key, you control your money. And that is what is really revolutionary about uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is that when you have this private key, it is under your full control. No one can censor your transactions. No one can take away your money. No one can, you know, burglarize your account unless they know your private key. Um, but your public key is what people can interface with. So that is what people can uh, send funds to. So if, you know, if I wanted Jeremy to send me some dash or whatever i would i would send him my public key and he could send it to me and he doesn't need, necessarily need to know who i am where i am um you know if i'm part of some company or whatever it can be totally pseudonymous and no one has to know about my true identity or or anything like that and on top of that i'm fully in control of my uh funds and the beauty of this is that when you have a wallet um to kind of tie it together um uh, they talked about the wallets and the public keys, private keys. All these words start swirling around in your head, and it's hard to um, – but the wallet is simply just a mobile app, on your, either on your phone or your desktop. Very similar process to downloading in any other app we've done before. So, so this is, is not necessarily something that's going to be difficult. And all your, your wallet does is hold your keys. So when we sit here and talk about you know, the security of your keys and the complexity, now there are some – diligence that you should do to to protect those keys but for the most part your day-to-day -day maintenance and spending sending and receiving traction transaction you don't have to actually deal with looking up and seeing your private keys and your private it's it's a lot like sending an email you, you basically you can hold your phone up to the other person's phone and essentially zap it over it's a very simplistic way of describing it but you'll see how how actually simple it is when you when you actually do it in practice and i scan your phone and i send the 
send send amount of Bitcoin, your phone dings, and that's the aha moment. And you go, well, that was it. Yeah, very fast, no information given. Uh, Alex, how about you? Do you have any uh, things that people generally ask you that uh, you know uh, about cryptocurrencies? Well, I want to go back to that peer to peer term. Um, it's kind of a weird term because even in crypto you're not directly paying the other person. And so, I mean, you still have miners and you still have master nodes. And so I, I think like with crypto, there's all this talk about decentralization and less middlemen, but really what it's doing is it, it's, it's removing as much of that as possible, but it doesn't get rid of it altogether. Um, and so, I mean, it's making it easier and uh, cheaper and faster for the user, um, but there's still another system that you have. And so like, I kind of struggle with that. There's a lot of, um, idealism and thought about this whole decentralized and peer to peer but like really at the end of the day you have to be careful what you say because you're you're in a way replacing one system with another system that um, in some cases has its own risks too too right. <clears throat> and uh doug go ahead and, and explain uh about a credit card like you know i don't know how cryptocurrency works but well do i know how my credit card works yeah i mean how many people could really intelligently formulate a, a, an explanation of how, our, first of all, our money comes into existence, how it's minted, how it's how it's printed. Um, secondly, when a tra uh, credit card transaction happens, how many people really know exactly the number of parties that it goes through, what's actually happening, you know, under the hood, so to speak. And so we don't understand it. We don't need to understand it. We know that it works. We know that, you know, we get to take our merchandise out of the store after we swipe that little card. And that's kind of, that's all we really need. Um, so Bitcoin, there's a lot of smart people out there. And, and I certainly encourage anyone who's curious to, to know how, the, how it works under the hood for Bitcoin. You know, all of us here are, are enthusiasts and we've done our fair bit of research just because we're, you know, we're nerds and we like reading up on that stuff. But for the people that, you know, that aren't necessarily needing, you know, you don't necessarily need to know all of that. Uh, terminology and exactly what's going on under the hood when you use Bitcoin and you see how fast and cheap it is for a lot of people that's all you really need to know and, and it fills the need a lot of people their their first experience with Bitcoin is not because they heard about it, it sounds like a great investment it's because they went online to buy a product and they realized that the merchant or the online website they were at only accepted cryptocurrency and so it was filling a need and that's an entirely different demographic for the people that are that are involved in cryptocurrencies. I mean, as I consider myself a hobbyist, but for many people, this is, it's, it's, it's a use case. It's a real world use case. And um, I'm using online website, you know, yeah. I mean, we have but, it, we have it easy here. We have access to banking and things like yeah. that, but people, you know, in other countries don't have that. And this really bridges that gap for them. Uh, you know, especially some of the people who are working for Amazon abroad, they don't get mm -hmm. paid in money, they actually get paid in what's called Mechanical Turk, or they're doing Mechanical Turk and they're paid in Amazon credits, uh, and they can't exactly eat all of those Amazon credits, so they have to turn to cryptocurrencies to, to convert that, to be able to have cash to spend that in other places. And I think the global use cases for instances like that and in developing countries are so much more compelling than the first world retail use case, you know? Right. Yeah. I think that's what has most of us so excited about cryptocurrencies, the ability to, to bring financial services to the unbanked and underbanked around the world. Yeah. And, and so when we come back, we're going to talk more with, with Jeremy and Avery over here about uh, ASU and what they've got going over there and kind of describe what that is and some of the other uh, technological breakthroughs that actually happened in the last week or so uh, that prove that crypto can compete with PayPal. And welcome back to the Crypto Show's Digital Cash Evolution. And I'm here with Doug from Phoenix Crypto. He's your go-to source for ATM services and learning about cryptocurrencies. And speaking of learning, we have the ASU guys here. And we're going to find out how they've got involved in this and how Dash is involved in uh, supporting them. So, Jeremy, tell me about it. Why, why ASU and how did you get Dash involved? Yeah, so when I got to ASU, it was, uh, or when I got to ASU in terms of the blockchain research, the Dash, so for anybody that doesn't know Dash, Dash has a proposal system where anybody can submit a proposal with a fee and you pretty much pitch your idea on why you think you deserve 
uh, deserve the money to build out whatever you propose. And so there was a partnership with ASU and Dash last summer to build out this blockchain research lab at ASU. And this happened for multiple reasons. One of them being is that the Dash headquarters is in uh, Tempe right next to ASU. And there's a, we, there's a business relationship with them where, you know, it was a strategic placement so that we can have ongoing research and we have, we can have a, a pipeline from the largest university. And so when I came in, that proposal has already had already been in and already been funded. And so the blockchain research lab was getting built up. And now within that first buildup of the lab, a main um, topic of research that we were interested in is scaling. Now, for anybody who doesn't know really how the Bitcoin network works or the Dash network works, is that unlike, for example, PayPal, when they have maybe a lot more transactions, they're in they're a centralized service, so they can always ramp up when necessary or ramp or you know decrease when necessary, and they have a lot more control over that. Um, and because they're centralized, you know you're losing some of the trust aspect or some of the decentralized aspect, but you're gaining some of that speed. Now, a big problem in the blockchain space or the cryptocurrency space is how can we keep the properties that we like in terms of decentralization? You know, we own our own money, but how do we also scale up so we can do those transactions like PayPal or like other services? So, you know, you're talking about PayPal. What, what about like Home Depot, Target, and all these guys? They've all, they have these centralized services and they get hacked. And then what happens to your information? And compare that with what happens to your information on the blockchain or any, any type of cryptocurrencies. Exactly. It's actually, it's, it's, I think it's a crazy idea that for us to make transactions with the, uh, with what, what we could say the norm as of now, uh, financial system is we give up every information. The legacy services. The, le the legacy <laughs> services. We give up all the information that we should be keeping private. So, you know, we're taught not to give our credit card number out, not to give any, all that information out. But every time we make a transaction, we're giving that information out. Whereas instead of uh, Bitcoin or Dash or any, you know. So uh, real quick on that, uh, Doug, what are the statistics on how many people actually get that information when you do a, a credit card transaction? I've heard up to seven parties that are involved in a credit card transaction. So now, so now I have to trust seven people every time I use my credit card. But with crypto, I have to trust no one. Exactly. And, and, and the reason why is because in cryptocurrencies, the information that you give to make a purchase is information that you're okay with being completely pub public to anybody. Whereas instead of the legacy system, the information that you give to make a purchase is the sensitive information that you don't want to give out to people. Right. Uh, that opens you up for identity theft and all, and all types of things like that. Yeah, man, I don't know about you. I cringe every time I'm, I've got a, I'm on the phone or something oh, and they God. say, read me the CVC code or read me the little Ooh, code right. on the back of your card. To, and I'm going, well, what's the point of this if, if I've got to give it to everybody to, right. to spend... Yeah, it's just some random person that's on the phone that I'm going to trust them just because they work for Home Depot or whoever, but I don't know what their situation is at home. Maybe they're going through a divorce or whatever, and uh, my credit card is uh, their way of getting out of that. Uh, so, <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So like one aspect of ASU and the partnership with Dash is we're doing research, and the research is geared towards scalability. How do we how can we scale the Dash network so that I can do more transactions? And we recently just uh, released a paper headed up by Nicole, uh, Nicole Chawla and Darren Tapp. And they created a, simula uh, a simulation. So um, most um, beforehand, so a lot of research um, in universities is done through simulations or emulations to where you realize that you can't necessarily play with the real network, but you can simulate it. You can use, use methods to, to see how it works. And um, we created a simulator for the Dash network because it is a little different than the Bitcoin network. And we ran simulations to see, can we scale a Dash? And uh, the results of our, of our research um, proves that we can scale a Dash at least 5x more than, it's current, um, than it is currently um, through other means of how we, uh, how we disseminate information across the network. So how does that compare with PayPal or... Yeah, so um, it's still it's still definitely underneath PayPal and the decentralized services. But I I, I personally am very confident that it's, it's the right step forward. And also, I, I think it's very impressive that we can you know make uh, you know get these results while the technology is still so young. I, I think some people don't realize that you know, for example, like machine learning has been around for a while, and that or artificial intelligence, and now just recently it's getting you know, a lot of hype because the technology has kind of caught up with it. 
Whereas cryptocurrencies and blockchain, it's only been around for 10 years. And uh, everybody's expecting, you know, the best, the best, the best, when in reality, it takes a lot of work. And that's what AC hopes to be able to do and build, build that progress up. Uh, what are one of the things that can be done to increase that scalability as far as uh, like increasing the block size? Or Yeah. So in cryptocurrencies, you're restrained by what's something called a block size. And that's just however much data you can fit into it. And so in, um, with a one megabyte block size restraint, um, it's around three to seven transactions per second, for example, like the Bitcoin network. Um, and one way to scale uh, a network is to increase that block size. Um, and that is what one of our simulations shows is that Dash can increase their block size up to at least 10 megabytes um, compared to their current two megabytes. And that's where I say we have we can have a 5x increase without losing a lot of the other features because um, some networks can't scale without losing other without losing other uh, aspects of their network because um, there's always trade offs with everything. But um, with our simulations, we found out that Dash can scale up to that um, without really losing any properties. And, and what about the ability to just integrate things like, you know, Bitcoin has added on top of it extra layers. I mean, what's to stop Dash from doing lightning networks or anything like that? Should they want to? Yeah. So the research that's being done at ASU right now uh, with the partnership with Dash is we were looking at on-chain scaling, which means we're looking at how can we scale the network at the protocol level with just the blockchain. Now, there are other cryptocurrencies looking at second layer solutions. Now, that's what, like you're talking about, the Lightning Network. It's second layer solutions to where, you know, a lot of research and study has been on the blockchain and we understand the properties of that. Not as much research has been done on these second layer solutions. And at least for now with Dash is we want to see how far we can scale blockchains by scaling the blockchain itself and not having to add all these other layers. Awesome. Um, what else? How about you, Avery? What, what, what's your position at ASU and what do you do there? So, uh, yeah, um, I'm a uh, researcher at the Blockchain Research Lab along with Jeremy. And um, I th so I got involved with blockchain because I was trying to teach it to myself and it was like the hardest thing ever to learn. And uh, finally, where I got, when I got some traction, I realized like I wanted to improve that process for other people. So um, I actually linked up with Jeremy. This was about a year ago and we started a small organization at ASU that was able to teach people about the intricacies of blockchain technology and all sorts of different stuff at the protocol level. And um, it was really rewarding. And then we ended up working in this lab. And so uh, the blockchain research lab is doing a bunch of different things. And what I predominantly focus on is um, outward, like outreach and getting uh, different types of other things involved in the lab, different companies that are interested in how it could apply to their business model or different, um, blockchain companies that want uh, specific research and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I would say all in all, the blockchain research lab is dedicated to kind of exploring different areas of research in blockchain while educating other people uh, outwardly. Awesome. And I want to go ahead and uh, mention our sponsors again and the event that we're having tonight. So come on out to Classic Crust Pizza at Cave Creek and, and, and Cactus Road. And Cactus Road. Cave Creek and Cactus Road is Classic Crust Pizza. Come on out, get a wallet, get some free cryptocurrency from us. And uh, yeah, what else can we expect? Um, well, all, you know, all of those things um, and answer any questions. I find that, it, you know, a dialogue is so much more productive than sitting down at your computer and Googling or watching YouTube videos where it's just a one way. It's a, right. you know. um, we have a lot of also check out uh, phoenixcrypto.com. Uh, he's got all of the locations for the for the ATMs. Uh, go to the crypto show dot com and you can find all of our archives uh, for any shows you might want to hear. We've got some pretty cool interviews on there. Uh, with some people you may not even expect. And uh, all of our social media there, you can sign up for all of our social media and go to dash.org and learn about Dash. And uh, what, do you have a, a website for ASU? Or? Um, yeah, so you can go to blockchain.asu.edu to find out any more information about ASU initiatives in general. All right, we'll be right back. And welcome back to the Crypto Show's Digital Cash Evolution. And I'm here with Doug Hodges from Phoenix Crypto. And Doug, you had a, an online question that came in? Yeah, yeah. Uh, before I read that, I just want to remind you for, if you want to call in by phone, you can call us at 602-277-KFNX. Um, and we'll answer questions just as I'm going to answer here. We got 
Damien writes in on Facebook, uh, the Facebook live feed. How would I know which cryptocurrency to buy into? There just seems to be so many out there to choose from. So I'm going to about face a little a bit. When I, when I talked a little earlier about how you don't always necessarily need to know exactly how things work under the hood if you just need to you know, buy your cup of coffee or buy something on the internet or, or spend bitcoins. If you are looking at cryptocurrencies to invest, um, then that's a different answer. And I think it is important that you do some due diligence to look into what you're investing into. If you'll notice, if you've listened to the show before, that we don't actually touch on the investment aspect of this. And that's intentional. Um, you know, even though I'm, a, you know, a Bitcoin trader and an ATM operator, I feel like m my biggest value is in educating the public because uh, a rising tide raises all ships. And so if we can educate the public and, and help people understand what this future is in this digital cash evolution, then, you know, the, you know, the, the investments and the other things are, are going to come in. But I look at my company, Phoenix Crypto, as an education company first. Um, and I go out of my way to make sure that my clients aren't spending more they, than they can afford to lose. And that's, you know, Bitcoin and, and other cryptocurrencies don't break the rules of traditional investment, you know, um, common sense. And so I, all of those things still apply. So absolutely do your due diligence before looking at any of the cryptocurrencies. And we are not financial advisors, but we can certainly answer your questions if you wanted to. We just buy one on TV, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, speaking of that education, uh, let's give Avery, we were talking about uh, the scholarship off air. Uh, so what, what is this thing with the scholarship that you guys have? Yeah, uh, I actually think I'll let Jeremy yeah, handle I'll, that I'll, one. I'll touch on that. So the scholarships was in part of another partnership with Dash, and we created this the, this scholarship program is because that yes, like like we're all talking here. I think education is one of the biggest aspects of blockchain technology that we're all clearly interested in, and it's kind of neglected in the space. You know, it's you know if you if you know a lot about about the space, a lot of times you 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 may not focus on the education because there's a lot of opportunities in the space. So us at ASC as being an academic organization is we wanted to really focus on education. And part of that is we created a Dash Scholar program where we gave 15 scholarships ranging from incoming freshmen all the way to graduate students um, money and to, to pursue their interest in blockchain technology, in cryptocurrencies at ASU. And we're really, we, we don't want to only build out and with this scholarship program is we're not only building out, here's some money, go, you know, you know, do whatever you want with it is, we want to create a system to where you understand that like coming to ASU and learning about blockchain technology, we have structure. There's, you know, a bunch of different avenues you can go to. It's not only a scholarship, but it's a program, you know, you can integrate and you can help us and you can learn. And I think that was our, our big focus. And that was funded by Dash once again. And uh, I'm really excited about that because, you know, as the school's school starting in a couple of weeks, I think we're going to see a lot new, uh, a lot more faces that are interested in cryptocurrencies and a lot of faces that um, will create, you know, the next best things and in the industry. This is not even the first time this has happened. The, the MIT is doing something similar with uh, studying blockchains. Mm -hmm. How does what you guys do differ from what they're doing? Yeah, so uh, there's a lot of schools um, starting to to do blockchain. You know, MIT has done it before ASU, but you know, we look at MIT, Berkeley, Princeton. A lot of schools are getting interested in it. And now even, you know, community colleges are getting interested in it. The I local, think ASU actually ranked above MIT in some technical yeah, aspects recently. Innovation. Yeah, right? we're, we're number one in innovation <laughs> three years in a row. That's, yeah. our, that's, our, that's our slogan <laughs> um, ahead of MIT and Stanford. We're, fi um, we're, finally, something, we're finally number one in something other than <laughs> Vegas party school. Yeah. That, or uh, number one in the heat, uh, heat index. <laughs> that too. <laughs> but, I, but I think it's even, it's interesting that you brought that up, how, you know, MIT is really, you know, getting partnered more on the Bitcoin side. But it's, it's crazy because the space is, you know, if they make improvements on Bitcoin or we make improvements on Dash, a lot of the time those results and those improvements are generalizable to many different blockchains. So it's not, you know, us competing versus them or all these academic institutions kind of competing against each other. In reality, it's, hey, you know, this is the work that we want to work on, but it honestly can be applied to, to many other, um, you know, organizations. And so I think that's one really cool aspect about Do, do you think you guys will at some point kind of reach back into the high school like come up with some kind of, a, you know, charity thing or whatever where you guys could actually go to high schools and, and, and get high school kids involved? Or So we yeah. definitely want to open it up into 
we definitely want to open it up to, to, to everybody. And one of the things that we're doing is we're making a Coursera course, which will be completely free for anybody to learn about blockchain technology online um, by themselves. Um, and that's one aspect that's, um, that was one aspect that ASU uh, specifically is doing. But then I'll let Avery talk about a different initiative that started from ASU that kind of tackles that same problem. Yeah. Uh, so I briefly mentioned a small organization that Jeremy and I started at ASU that helped educate others on blockchain. And that small organization has actually grown out into becoming a nonprofit. And what we're doing is putting together a bunch of free material for people to learn about things and uh, be able to hold uh, their own meetups wherever they want uh, based on our material. And that, uh, that organization is called the Blockchain Innovation Society. And it started as a small club at ASU where we took a bunch of people and we gave lectures on all sorts of different things. We gave lectures on Ethereum, Dash, you know, the Lightning Network, all sorts of different things that people were largely kind of, uh, kind of grasping for info and they didn't really know where to go. And so we were able to help people like that. And so I think in the future, getting high schoolers involved is extremely important because uh, that hasn't, it's a, you know, there's a lot of really talented minds in high school and there's a lot of free info that's kind of hard to get all together in one place. And so that's what we're trying to do. Um, and we've actually had some interest from high schoolers that have come out to certain tech meetups in, in Phoenix and of, we've linked them into, you know, our, our Slack channel and stuff like that. So, what, what about like a uh, gaming industry? Have you, are you guys looking into making any inroads in, with gamers or? Uh, I think, uh, I don't, we haven't made any inroads directly to gamers, but I think gamers are the ones that are, you know, they understand how the online, you know, how the internet works. They understand new technology. They want to be on well, the floor. Gaming is a virtual world and this is a virtual yeah. currency. So it's, it's a no brainer. I don't know why a cryptocurrency isn't more ingrained in gaming already. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think uh, non-fungible assets will be utilized in gaming. So, you know, uh, certain things that you don't want to be ma manipulated and copied in a game, that have value because like people sell tokens in games to other people, yeah, but you swords know. and clubs exactly. and whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so uh, what, what else do you guys got going there that at, at ASU that you can talk about? So um, there is a lot of cool stuff kind of around the board. We have the law school that is participating in some sort of uh, blockchain type stuff where they hold meetings about how blockchain and law go together. Um, we've seen, a lot of great people come out specifically to those types of ASU events, different legislators in the Valley. Uh, one of them is Jeff Weninger. I believe that's how he pronounced his name. He's passed all sorts of really cool bills uh, regarding blockchain and its acceptance in Arizona. Um, uh, isn't there a, a tax law that was passed regarding uh, cryptocurrencies I, here in Arizona? I think the one where you can pay your bill. Yeah. Yeah, you can pay your tax bill with, with cryptocurrencies now? I believe the bill died the last time I talked to uh, the representative, but I'm, I'm not completely sure on that. Yeah, I don't think it passed. It didn't pass. Okay. So what else you got, Jeremy? Um, What else for, for ASU? So we talked about the research, talked about the Coursera. We talked about these scholarships. Um, one thing that we're, we're also really excited for is a uh, Coursera course that's going to be open online. Um, people can also do it for a certificate with Coursera, but not only that, you can also have it to where it goes towards uh, an ASU degree. And so if you want to learn blockchain technology and you're also interested in getting a master's degree um, online, you know, ASU will be offering that and the blockchain course will be part of that. In addition, we're finally going to have a solidified blockchain and cryptocurrency course out on campus um, in kind of conjunction with, with the Coursera course. And so... Um, we're doing we're doing a lot of work there, and the research is expanding a lot. Especially where you're looking at you know the sustainability industry with carbon credits. Um, we're looking at uh, water conservation. We're looking at a lot of these different industries that you may not think blockchain technology, but you know we're making a lot of uh, strides in all in all areas. All right. Well, thanks a lot, and this has been great information. Be sure to come out and check us out tonight at Classic Crust Pizza at Cave Creek. And Cactus Road. And Cactus Road. Why can I never remember? I know right where it's at. And check out phoenixcrypto.com. And the cryptoshow.com. Check out all of our, you know, social media, SoundCloud, YouTube, all of that stuff. We are looking for Bitcoin ATM hosts. So business owners that run a, a, a business or a restaurant or something that is willing, we will pay you to put our ATM in there. And you will definitely get customers 
uh, because Bitcoiners are awful. <laughs> they They're are loyal. Very, very loyal. They will come and spend their money. 